Welcome to this edition of Theological Journals at 4.30 p.m. on 25 August 2022. We're with Dr. Cornelius Venema, who's talking about effectual calling. We will stick with Francis Turretin as the chief expositor of this great theological doctrine. So we pick up here on effectual calling. In his account of effectual calling, Dr. Kevin Van Huser uses the language of communicative joint to explain how God moves recipients of the gospel call to do what the call summons them to do. When God speaks his word with the linguistic community of the church, he does not move those he addresses in a causal manner, though he moves his hearers to do what the summons call summons them to do. He does not produce this effect after the manner of X pushes, pulls, heats, freezes, saves. Why? Because God addresses human beings in and through his word, the communicative joint that moves them to respond as they do, resides within their engagement with the word and what it requires, interpretation. When God communicates himself to us. He does so as the spirit comes to the word and empowers it to become effectual. To explain the spirit's ministry of the word in effectual calling, Van Hooser coins the expression advenient of grace, the spirit advenes or comes to the word as the gospel is proclaimed. Viewing effectual calling as a divine speech act allows us to go beyond the traditional view that the spirit uses the word as an instrumental cause. Though the language of instrumental cause may serve well to describe the way one were to move a piece of wood or stone, it fails to do justice to the way God's work of grace is congruous with human nature. When God draws people to himself through effectual calling, his action is not causal, but communicative. The word itself has a kind of force. One might say then, with regard to grace, that the medium is the message. The word of God speaks in the gospel is more than an instrument of the Spirit's work in effectual calling. When God communicates through the gospel narrative recounted in scripture and proclaimed in the word event of preaching, he does more than utter words of locutions that provide information about himself and the world. When the narrative of the gospel is communicated in words, God displays a world and commends a way of viewing and evaluating it, says Kevin Van Huser. We turn now to Global Anglican with Rich Duncan talking about John Owen and the dangers of Biblicism. He's been taking the Socinians to task. In response, Reformed Orthodoxy appealed to the traditional paradigm of the threefold office of Christ, and in particular his priesthood. Historically, the subject of Christ's work has been approached either from the angle of Christ's two estates, his humiliation and exaltation, or through the lens of Christ's three principal roles as prophet, priest, and king. The Socinians had no conception of Christ's humiliation, given that he had never been equal to God in their eyes. Thus, Owen and others sought to fight on the shared ground of the threefold office. Yet Truman observes the disparity with respect to this model. The level of disagreement between Owen and his Socinian opponents on the issue of the threefold office is evident from the relative space which they each in turn devote to each office. 
Unsurprisingly, the notion of Christ as prophet, teacher, and example received by far the longest treatment in the Rakovian Catechism, almost to the exclusion of Christ's other roles, per Lindsay. <clears throat> Our Lord was, for the Socinians, simply a prophet sent from God to proclaim a superior kind of morality. His highest function was to communicate knowledge to men and perhaps teach them by example how to make use of it. They had no conception that Jesus came to do something for his people. Christ's death was simply an example to his followers of how to persevere to the end as well as the ultimate demonstration of God's love. Christ's priesthood, his mediatorial role in overcoming the problem of sin, was the climax for Owen's soteriology and has been described as the governing category of Owen's Christology, following a similar emphasis by Calvin. Indeed, Truman argues that at the heart of all of Owen's polemical interaction throughout his career lay his theology of Christ's priesthood. By contrast, Christ's role as priest constituted little more than a footnote in Socinian treatises, largely subsumed by Christ's lordship. Bavic comments, they in fact make his priestly office a mere appendix to his kingly office. Tay argues that for Owen, Christ's priestly acts are twofold, oblation and intercession, which the Socinians entirely collapsed, believing them to be post-ascension performances. This is imaginary oblation in Owen's words, since intercession can only take place on the basis of oblation whilst intercession is its effic efficacious outworking. Very nice. Global Anglicanism, the Summer Edition, and Lambeth Conference and the Church of England by Keith Sinclair. And it has come and passed, but this is an introduction to the current one. I am writing on the developments within the Church of England this year as the Archbishop of Canterbury asks bishops from all over the Anglican Communion to come to the Lambeth Conference this July. I'm writing in a personal capacity at the end of a year serving as part-time National Director of the Church of England Evangelical Council, CEEC. A key dimension of the Church of England's life this year will be the ending of the formal consultation of living in love and faith, LLF, process in April 2022. The consideration by the Church of England bishops of a report from Next Steps Group in September 2022 so that they can then propose a way forward for the General Synod 2023. In this article, I would like to include some reflections on the LLF process in England. Though I believe there are positives in the LLF process which must not be ignored, there are also significant concerns. I want to consider how those positives and concerns relate to global Anglicans, and in particular to the Lambeth Conference this summer. As it will be seen, these concerns about LLF relate chiefly to the authority of Scripture in the life of the Church. I want to consider the role First Peter has in the work of this Lambeth Conference, as this is the biblical book the bishops will be studying together, guided by a global commentary on First Peter, edited by Jennifer Strawbridge, published by SCM. 2020. Living in Love and Faith Reflections. Let me begin the LLF and reflections both positive and otherwise. I will then consider the Lambeth Conference, give some brief reflections on 1 Peter, and explain why the concerns I have for the Church of England after LLF are the same concerns I have for the Anglican Communion after Lambeth. 
hoping these reflections will spur us to prayer for the Church of England and Anglican Communion and help those preparing to come to Lambeth or who have decided not to come to know how to be prepared for them, themselves. As beyond the scope of this article to summarize the argument of LLF course or give an account of its history, its own website should help the curious. And there are numerous resources on the CEEC website. An excellent book length response is the analysis by Martin Davy, theological consultant to the CEEC. The whole book is worthy of study, but the headings in chapter four, a theological response, assessing LLF material, give an overview shared by many ev evangelicals across the Church of England. We now turn to Hedgehog Review, an academic journal on culture. This is an article on politics, anyone. Rawls, R-A-W-L-S, believe that we ought to respect citizens' basic liberties, ensure equal opportunity among them, and accept inequality in the distribution of wealth only when it benefits the least fortunate. These are principles advanced in his 1971 classic a Theory of Justice. In a subsequent book, Political Liberalism, 1993, he identified political liberals, all those who would endorse at least the first principle, respect for basic liberties, and do so in a way independent of any non-political beliefs they may have. To be sure, these works and the discussions based on them have given rise to some very interesting ideas yet they've also amounted to little more than tinkering with the rules of the game that nobody, one hopes, will ever play. Who can be gotten to play unfair games, Rawls once asked, expressing a concern reflected in his vision of just politics as fair politics. The question, however, neglects the fact, to put it bluntly, politics is no game. Yes, it is seen many players. To pick up just one example, critics often justly, rightly compare the previous youth president to a professional wrestler. Rawls' followers would doubtless think it self-evident that we need fewer politicians like Donald Trump. Yet certain forms of liberal politics make way for exactly such individuals. Ironically, it took an admirer of authoritarianism, indeed a Nazi jurist, to make this connection clear. Carl Schmitt criticized a conception of liberalism akin to Rawls for supporting this kind of constitution that may dissipate into mere rules of the game and its ethics into a mere ethic of fair play. As a political philosopher and classicist, Leo Strauss aptly described Schmidt's critique, this kind of liberalism leads to the establishment of a world of entertainment, a world of amusement, a world without seriousness. Ultimately, that can be serious itself. The fact that Strauss was a Platonist adds even more irony since Plato is the thinker most responsible for the idea that, if not politics, then political philosophy is a kind of game. This is why he has Socrates apologized in the Republic for having forgot that we were playing, and so having taken the project of constructing an ideal city in speech too seriously. Rawls proposed his own famous thought experiment, taking a step beyond the veil of ignorance in order to reason from the perspective of the original position and therefore arrive at the principles of justice. By all accounts, however, Rawls took political philosophy seriously. Yet one 
Yet when communitarians such as Michael Sandel complained that his approach implied a particular conception of the self, Rawl demurred, quote, when we simulate being in this original position, our reasoning no more commits us to metaphysical doctrine about the nature of the self than our playing a game like Monopoly commits us to thinking we are landlords engaged in desperate rivalry, win or take all. Rawls tried to avoid metaphysics because he felt that it interfered with his great game. People will probably always disagree fundamentally about religion, philosophy, and morals, and it's no coincidence that these topics are also bound up with metaphysics in various ways, you think? Rawls nevertheless thought that despite holding very different fundamental beliefs, people can still come together by adopting systematically uniform unified rules for politics. After all, don't such rules already regulate other shared activities, not least that of playing games? How about the willingness to lie world without end, as we have seen in modern times? It takes more than a set of systematically unified rules to constitute a game, however, to qualify as such, the rules must be adopted first and foremost for their own sake. It's for this reason that the answer to any question about why people should respect them, no touching the ball with your hand, say, or kicking the puck into the net with your skate, is ultimately always just because. That's how the game is played. Nothing more. It must be so since it is only when we accept the rules as ends in themselves that we can treat them in a disinterested, playful way. True, people sometimes also attach serious external goods to games. Professional athletes, for example, earn a living from them. Just as fans sometimes take great pride in those athletes' exploits. Still, we know these goods are situated outside the game because one can always play for free or without spectators. Politics, anyone? This is by Carl Blackberg, professor of political philosophy at the University of Montreal. We turn to Dallas Magazine by Neil Coulter, synagogue at Capernaum, Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship. As Professor Daryl Box says in this issue, good works are part of what God is hoping for from us as he reshapes us. The fruit of the Spirit is nothing but good works of a solid character. As poiema, the Greek word for handiwork or workmanship, all believers evidence the process of his working in our lives in many ways, including in solid, tangible works. In, Levit in Luke 7, 1 to 10, a centurion requests healing from Jesus, not for himself, but for his servant. Jewish representatives from Capernaum, that small city about 10 o'clock on the Sea of Galilee, maybe 11 o'clock, the centurion's respect for their community and his servant. This man deserves to have you do this. The Jewish elders also tell Jesus that the centurion has built our synagogue. The centurion modeled counter-cultural living. He turned away from Rome's scorn for the Jews, and his compassion for his servant went beyond the expected attitude toward servants as mere property. His character was manifested in a costly way, a building, something that could not be hidden or denied. The outworking of poema, or handiwork, catches Jesus' attention, who heals the servant and praises the centurion's faith. 
physical evidence for the centurion's contribution continues to speak today. Visitors to Capernaum can view glimpses of the seaside village as it was at the time Jesus lived and taught there, but they must dig beneath the surface. Under the ruins of a Byzantine church lies a house that may have been Simon Peter's residence. Near that house are the remains of a synagogue. Several times in the Gospels we see Jesus in a Capernaum synagogue. Because of its probable connection to Jesus, the synagogue ruins in Capernaum hold great interest. It is the most significant of on the only remaining examples of first century synagogues. Others are identified at Masada, down off the Dead Sea, Herodium, Gamla, and Magadha. The history of its discovery, the road to finding and identifying Capernaum's first century synagogue is a fascinating story. From several architectural fragments at the site, Edward Robinson first identified the synagogue in 1830. The site continued to attract interest and looters. So in 1894, the Franciscan order purchased the site to prevent further damage. From 1921 to 26, a Franciscan friar directed the excavation of the synagogue, dating it to the early first century. Scholars later amended that estimate, suggesting that what's visible on the surface must have been built later, sometime during the second through fifth centuries. In 1968, the Franciscans excavated again. Scholars agreed that the synagogue was not the building where Jesus preached. The surface level building was constructed of white limestone blocks, a spectacular contrast to the gray or black basalt used in most of the town's structures. But in 1968, excavation revealed clues about something just below the surface of the limestone building, black basalt walls. These walls had been assumed to be the foundation of the synagogue, but some details didn't fit. Along with the different material, the basalt walls puzzled researchers because of their occasional misalignment with the upper structure. If the walls were a foundation, then why didn't they perfectly match the limestone building above? Further work in 1981 brought answers. Several feet below the floor of the later synagogue, the team found a black basalt cobbled pavement, clearly the floor of an earlier building. The thickness of the basalt walls indicate that the earlier structure was a public building. The basalt walls do, don't precisely line up with the synagogue structure above because they weren't that building's foundation, as previously assumed. They were a first century synagogue. A century after the first archaeological investigation, we now see evidence of two synagogues, and we can understand the earlier building not only as the site of several key moments in the Gospels, but also of the ongoing workmanship, the poema, the handiwork, the results of a faithful centurion. The walls still talk in the English cathedrals and the churches of old, the tombstones, the pulpits, the aisles, the clerestries, and other features in ancient Britain. Turn our attention now to the fundamentals in the faith, and we're talking with Dr. Wright about <coughs> hextatuchal composition or the composition of the Pentateuch, which has been attacked so viciously and vitriolically in the 19th and 20th centuries. 
pick up here in the middle of it, and this has been very influential, Graf Valhausianism. I think it's largely dead today, but so many have not excavated this and seen the importance for modernity, which is our one of our concerns. Moreover, we know what can be done, or rather what cannot be done, in the analysis of literary compositions. Some of the plays of Shakespeare are called his mixed plays because it is known that he collaborated with another author in production. The very keenest critics have sought to separate his play in these plays from the rest, but they confess that the results are uncertain and dissatisfying. Coleridge professed to distinguish the passage contributed by Shakespeare by a process of feeling, but Macaulay pronounced this claim to be nonsense, and the entire effort, whether made of the phraseology or style or aesthetic perceptions, is an admitted failure. And this in spite of the fact that the sh style of Shakespeare is one of the most peculiar and inimitable. The Anglican Prayer Book is another composite production, which the higher critics have often been invited to analyze and distribute to its various sources. Some of the authors of these sources lived centuries apart. They are well, now well known from the studies of historians. But the prayer book itself does not reveal one of them, though its various vocabularies and style have been variously interrogated. Now, if the analysis of the Pentateuch can lead to such certainties as the graphy cultists would have it, why should not the analysis of Shakespeare or the prayer, prayer book accomplish the same? How can they accomplish in a dead language what they cannot accomplish in a living language? How can they distinguish 10 or 18 or 22 collaborators in a small literary production when they cannot distinguish two? These questions have been asked many times, but the higher critics have given no answer whatever, preferring the safety of a learned silence. The oracles are dumb. Number three, much has been made of the differences of vocabulary in the Pentateuch, and elaborate lists of words have been assigned to each of the so-called four authors, J-E-D-P. But these distinctions fade away when subjected to powerful scrutiny. And even Driver admits that the phraseological criteria are very slight. Or, in the problem of the Old Testament, who quotes this testimony, adds, they are slight, in fact, to a degree of tenuity that often makes the recital of them appear like trifling. And so much for the first fallacy of graph cultism, and we'll proceed to the theory of evolution in our next edition. Theory of evolution applied to literature, mosaic composition, and religion. We turn from that to the fundamentals in the faith, volume two, an article by Dr. James Gray on the inspiration of the Bible, definition, extent, and proof things you will not hear in a modern pulpit in the decadent orbit in which I circulate. Dr. James Gray, an old Reformed Episcopalian, an old school Anglican. Inspiration of the Bible, definition, extent, and proof. In this paper, the authenticity and credibility of the Bible are assumed by which it is meant, number one, that its books were written by the authors to whom they are ascribed and that their contents are in all material points as they came from their hands. 
Number two, that those contents are worthy of entire acceptance as to their extent, statement of fact. Were there need to prove these assumptions, the evidence is abundant, and abler pens have dealt with it. Let it not be supposed, however, that because these things are assumed, their relative importance is undervalued. On the contrary, they underlie inspiration. And as President Pat Patterson of Princeton Seminary says, they come in on the ground floor. They have to do with the historicity of the Bible. And as we were talking about graph culties in the last article, they have turned the book of Moses into vague myths, historical legends, compilations that grew by leaps and bounds through an unregulated oral process. So it is asserted by those cultists and vandals. Back to Dr. Gray. They have to do with the history of the Bible, which for us is now the basis of its authority. Nothing can be settled until this is settled, but admitting its settlement, which all things considered, we now may be permitted to do, what can be of deeper interest than the question as to how far that authority extends. This is the inspiration question. And while so many have taken in hand to discuss, discuss the others, may not one be at liberty to discuss this? It is an old question, so old indeed, as again in the usual recurrence of thought to have become new. Our fathers discussed it. It was what the one great general question once upon a time. It was sifted to the bottom a great storehouse of fact and argument, an illustration has been left to draw for us to draw upon in our day of need. For a long while, the enemy's attack has directed our energies to another part of the field, but victory there will drive us back to this question again. The other questions are outside of the Bible itself. This one is inside. They lead men away from the contents of the book to consider how they came. This brings us back to consider, considering what they are. Happy the day when the inquiry returns here and happy the generation which has now forgotten to meet it. And we will call this segment to an end and return at a later point today in our discussions theological journals. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, author of the scriptures, whose glory was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Godspeed. Good to have you here.